Good morning. Welcome to the Health Insurance and Long-Term Care Issues Committee, the best committee at NCOIL, and I appreciate every one of you staying here till Sunday morning. Thank you, Will, for putting us on Sunday morning. Um, so today we have a bunch of different interesting topics and some that we had discussed at our previous meeting. Um, but I'm going to ask my colleagues uh, for a motion to waive quorum. Can I get a motion? Second? All in favor? Thank you. And I'm also going to ask for a motion to adopt the November 18th, 2021 committee meeting minutes. Can I have a motion for that? Second? All in favor? All right. Long night last night. So we are going to continue our discussion on the 340B drug pricing program. Uh, before we hear from our speakers, I just want to make a few remarks about the background for this topic. Uh, we had a very good introductory discussion on this issue at our last meeting in Scottsdale. Great location. Uh, since that time, uh, the National Community Health Centers and 340B Health, both who are here today, have submitted draft language for consideration to use as a starting point for developing a model law. Uh, that language will appear on page 235 in your binders, colleagues. Uh, as you can see, there is no sponsor attached to this at this point. Um, it's for discussion purposes for now. I'll note that I am interested in sponsoring the model. Um, that I brought forward from our discussion at our last meeting, uh, but we want to hear more about it, and our colleagues actually had a lot of questions at our last meeting, so we want to dig deep into this, and it may be a case for after hearing this, it'll result in maybe not even creating a draft model at all. Um, as you know, uh, many of you know, um, as I've been here several years, that I did used to work at a federally qualified health center uh, that Health Center is now in my district that has several locations. This is a very important issue to me. 340B really affects uh, some of the uh, fiscal uh, issues that the, the center has. So um, before we get started, I just also want to note that this topic will be transferred to the Joint State Federal Relations and International Insurance Issues Committee. Uh, since 340B uh, is a federal program, I think it's proper to committee to have jurisdiction over this issue in that committee. So let's get started. If we could please have to come to the, the speaker table, Jeremy Crandall, who is with the National Association of Community Health Centers, Greg Doggett, Vice President, Legal and Policy Counsel for 340B Health, uh, our Logan Yoho, who is from PharmD, Abby Real and Nick Doherty, please come. And we are going to hear from our Logan first, please. Uh, we've allocated about 30 minutes for this. Uh, we want to make sure we have enough time for questions from our colleagues. So if you would like to get started, please. Good morning, Ms. Chairwoman and members of the NCOIL. Thank you for having me today. Um, so I'll be talking about the impact of 340B in community health centers. So um, like the chairwoman said, she uh, has a past history in federally qualified health centers and I am also in that space. I am the director of pharmacy at Hopewell Health Centers. I'm also a Apexis certified 340B expert and I am the current vice president of the Ohio Pharmacists Association. Next slide, please. So Hopewell Health Centers is a federally qualified health center. We currently have 27, soon to be 29 sites in southeastern Ohio. We cover nine counties and all of which are very rural. We're a tier three patient-centered medical home and we serve approximately 39,000 patients annually. 10% of those are uninsured and 47% are Medicaid. So our patients are very underserved and high risk patients for being part of the healthcare safety net. We have a variety of services, including primary care, behavioral health, psychiatry, dental, as well as other services. So the 340B program intent is to, to stretch scarce federal resources as far as possible reaching more eligible patients and providing more comprehensive services. 
So everything we do with the 340B program meets this intent. It allows us to treat more patients and be able to stretch our grant dollars that are a large part of our funding even further. So the 340B savings, the basic idea is that we pay less for the drug. We're able to bill that drug for patients and um, the, the savings, the difference is reinvested into patient care. So we do that in multiple ways. One of the ways we've done it at our health center is providing a clinic pharmacy. So we opened a pharmacy in our busiest clinic um, and we have a full staff providing both dispensing pharmacy services as well as clinical pharmacy services. Um, you can see there my staff with um, one of our state legislators there. We have free prescription delivery that delivers to our entire footprint. Um, that is a big cost expense for our health center because we cover 4,400 square miles of Ohio. So it is a big expense to have three full-time drivers as well as vehicle upkeep um, that we wouldn't be able to do without the 340B savings. In addition, we have a sliding fee prescription discount for patients that are at or below 200% of the federal poverty level. This allows us to provide things like insulin and EpiPens, which I'm sure you all know how expensive those items are to these uninsured patients for just dollars. Um, we basically give them that medication at our cost plus a dispensing fee. So we're able to provide these medications at something that is truly accessible to them. With the 340B savings, we also are able to do things like have um, programs where we're able to reach out to our patients to provide services that they need. And we meet that on a case-by-case uh, -case basis. So we might have patients that um, are needing blister packaging. Um, that's a very time-consuming process that a lot of pharmacies charge for, and that's something we do for our patients at no charge to be able to increase their adherence to their medication and make it easier for them to understand. <clears throat> In addition to our clinic pharmacy, there's many other things we can do with our 340B savings. Um, we have several school-based clinics, so we actually have primary clinics, primary care clinics that are embedded into high schools and middle schools. This includes, um, we're able to increase vaccination rates. One of our clinics has dental operatories and we've been able to increase the, the dental health of our students in those schools. We've had a great relationship with these schools and in fact, they've asked us to expand services beyond primary care. So that's when the dental health came in as well as um, now we're starting to have um, psychiatric and um, behavioral health services within the schools as well. In fact, we opened a clinic in one of the schools in our area last year, last January, and they've already asked us to double our space and they gave us um, more space within the school in order to expand services because it was so valuable to that underserved area. Dental services, for those that don't know, dental uh, reimbursement is not um, the greatest. And um, often these clinics cannot pay for themselves um, if they rely on their dental services alone, especially when it comes to our Medicaid patients. It is very difficult for Medicaid patients to find a dentist that will take Medicaid because reimbursement is so poor. So with the 340B program, we're able to expand those services and have dental clinics in places where there is really a desert. It also has allowed us to uh, start mobile dental services. So we have a dental hygienist and a dental assistant that will travel to clinics that don't have dental services available and they will um, provide that dental hygiene in between visits. One of the biggest ways it has been, um, we've been making an impact with 340B has been the opioid epidemic. As anyone from the Midwest knows, it has hit us hard. And Ohio has been, um, Ohio and our neighbors have been pretty much ground zero for the opioid epidemic. So with the 340B program, it has allowed us to expand our medication assisted treatment program 
we use a drug called Vivitrol um, that we're able to um, get these patients um, totally opioid free and um, able to resume their uh, daily lives. And it, it's the, the amount of lives we have saved has been incalculable because of this program. It would not be possible without 340B. Um, these shots are very expensive to obtain. And if we didn't have 340B, we would not be able to stock them in the clinics. So we're able to keep a stock. That way when the patient is ready to get their shot, we can give it at that same time. And we don't have them waiting because in the past when we couldn't do that, the patient may relapse between our clinic and the pharmacy to go get the shot. So it also allows us to um, open additional sites in underserved areas. Because of where I'm from, um, we are very rural. Um, a lot of these places are healthcare deserts. They're not a single option for healthcare in some of these small towns. So being able to open, uh, open community health centers in those uh, areas have really increased the health care of the patients there and ultimately lengthen their lives. This is not something we do, but a lot of my colleagues in other health centers have also used the money to purchase mobile health clinics. So they might have a bus that goes around to indigenous areas. And one of my closest colleagues in uh, urban Columbus has actually done this with their 340B funds and visits areas that don't have any health care and um, may not be the best areas in town and um, able to provide hope to those patients. So all that brings us to where pharmacy benefit managers or PBMs intersect with the 340B program. Uh, because covered entities like myself, that's the, that's the term in the law that uh, describes any 340B provider. Um, because we purchase the medication le significantly less for the drugs, um, PBMs have identified a potential increase in revenue. So they're paying us less. Um, this has started about five, six years ago and has progressively gotten worse. Health centers like my own are required by law, regulation, and mission to reinvest 100% of that, those dollars back into health care. So every bit of that money is going to, back to that intent, stretch our scarce federal resources in order to be able to treat more patients. So there have been multiple methods used by PBMs, um, such as decreased reimbursement rates for medications at 340B pharmacies. Um, when I was doing some analysis on what this looked like, um, I was able to find one PBM that was paying me a pro as low as 3% of what their competitor PBMs were on similar claims. That is devastating to the pharmacies. Um, that same PBM, Every time I, in, I administered a shingle shot to a patient, I lost $45. So it wasn't just that I wasn't being paid as much, I'm actually paying to administer that drug. But we do it because we're there to help patients. But that's not sustainable over the long term. There's also uh, PBMs that have totally excluded us from their 340B networks, or from their, uh, <clears throat> from their pharmacy networks altogether. So there's one PBM that I'm thinking of that um, excluded me completely. I could not enroll as a pharmacy with them because I had a certain percentage of 340B claims and they would not tell us what that threshold was. So I was excluded altogether and it was a pretty large commercial plan in my state. And then also there have been um, some PBMs that have leveraged fees against um, covered entities that are not leveraged against pharmacies of a similar size elsewhere. So all of these methods are just um, pulling money away from the, the intent of the program. The, the bipartisan intent of the program was to stretch these resources and allow us to reinvest it into healthcare. So during 2020, um, Ohio 340B covered entities worked with the Ohio legislators, including one of your own, Senator Bob Hackett, um, who was our bill sponsor, to create a bill that would protect 340B pharmacies. Um, this was a little complicated during the pandemic to get a bill through before the end of our General Assembly in Ohio, but 
Um, we did it in the nick of time. Um, the bill created a structure um, by which we could be fairly paid for the services we provide while at the same time maintaining those 340B savings um, to stretch federal resources. We did not want to be um, have a leg up. We just wanted a level playing field. Uh, at least 16 states have passed similar legislation, but it's a constant improvement on our bills because um, there have been loopholes that have been found in the bills, so we constantly have to improve the bills and improve um, that we're making sure that we're protecting these covered entities so we can protect the most vulnerable Americans. And that concludes my portion. Thank you. We'll do questions at the end. Uh, Abby? Thank you for having me here today. I'm Abby Real, Director of Advocacy for Mountain Health Network, uh, which includes two hospitals, um, Cabell Huntington Hospital, St. Mary's Medical Center in Huntington, West Virginia. So we are a border area. Um, we also have Pleasant Valley Hospital, which is in Point Pleasant along the Ohio River as well. Um, next slide, please. Um, for us, for 340B in West Virginia, you will see that we had over four closures and two bankruptcies of hospitals in West Virginia. Uh, rural providers are struggling, even more so with COVID right now. Um, for us in our health system, um, there's a little note there that over 200 million in uncompensated care is what we do throughout our health system every year. Um, our 340B uh, drug savings is a quarter of that, if that gives you any idea. And the programs that we have been able to do in our health system are critical to our area as over 80% of our payer mix are uh, capitated. So that's Medicare, Medicaid, PIA, which is our state insurance. It's all rates that they're telling us what they're going to pay us, and that's what you get. Um, so we only have about 12 to 15% commercial payers, essentially. So when we're looking at um, uncompensated care, it's, it's pretty large for us, but we do have um, clinical pharmacists throughout our region and throughout our hospitals. Um, we are not able to bill for those services other than for commercial payers. So being able to have that clinical pharmacist working hand in hand with our um, physicians every day is critical. We also have a cash card program for patients for um, any type of drug savings or anything like that. We also have a meds to beds program, so whenever you're being discharged from the hospital, you're able to go home with your medication that day. We also have our moms program, which this goes into, I'm sure everybody has heard of West Virginia and our substance use problem. Um, we were able to create a moms program for our mothers suffering with substance use disorder that give birth and are not in a current program. They enroll in this six month to a year program through our health system. We have seen huge strides in that program. Um, we also have a neonatal therapeutic unit. We were the first in the country to do that. Um, so one of our NICU nurses saw um, babies that were withdrawing, and we created this unit. We have anywhere from 18 to 32 babies within that unit at any given time. And their stays can be anywhere from 30 to 60 days. And that's where our mom's program intersects with that. I actually used to be a baby cuddler um, that would volunteer and go up during my lunch hour and cuddle babies. And you would never see um, the parents and until we started the moms program, you now see the mothers and the fathers being very integrated into caring for that baby. So this has been huge for us. Um, also, financial spiritual care is provided at PROACT, which is a unique program that also is for substance use and includes MAT. And we also have a pharmacy there. Um, we also have um, other community health screenings and clinics throughout the area. We provide one every fall, which is a free screening as well as medically indicated food boxes. We recently did a medically indicated food box program at our dialysis center, which is for our patients there, and we've seen a 30% reduction in um, readmissions, which is huge, especially for that patient population. Um, we've also been able to provide free care, and then school-based clinics is what our um, fellow FQHCs that we partner with are offering throughout the state. Um, so with West Virginia, the importance for us is hospital programs. Um, over 300 million of 340B goes into West Virginia. Without 340B, there's no doubt in my mind that you will see more hospitals and entities shutter. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is our PBM reform within West Virginia, and we started in 2017 with the Pharmacy Audit Integrity Act, which essentially started auditing, licensing um, PBMs in the state, which is critical and key. Um, you'll notice that with PBM regulation, 340B um, discriminatory uh, it, uh, language actually intersects and intertwines throughout, um, but we actually didn't start that until 2019 where we instituted 340B protections. 
Um, and for us, within the health system, within the hospitals throughout the state, um, especially FQHCs, other community providers, that was a big deal for us. Um, ever since in 2020, there was Rutledge versus PCMA, which was a decision that allowed for uh, um, legislatures to um, regulate ERISA plans. So of course in 2021, we did legislation to include that. We also did um, a lot of reform that year, actually on rebates that go back to the patients at the point of, of sale. I'm still working through that one, but also we did um, more 340B protections. And in 2022, we currently have legislation right now that codifies our uh, legislative rules that we did within 2021. Um, next slide, please. So within the Pharmacy Audit Integrity Act, I cannot express how important definitions are, as well as um, the licensure of the PBMs. So for us, we worked very closely with the insurance commissioner who um, really um, went in when it came to legislative rules as well. So those specific protections went even more so in the legislative rule process. Our process in West Virginia is a little different from other states where it goes before the legislature, you have a whole year before that they go through the legislative rulemaking process and then the legislature essentially approves it. We had no issues with our legislative rules as the chair of that committee um, knew about PBMs as his mother was a pharmacist. So, um, but with 340B specific pr uh, protections within the legislative rule, um, that was really key for us in moving forward in the 22 legislative session. Next slide. And one thing, um, being in politics all my life, is I really like to see um, when legislation, you can actually use it. And it was very exciting for us to be able to see all of our legislation over the past couple of years be used whenever Express Scripts, which is a PBM, um, back February 24th of last year, um, put out a mandate that we would have to start retroactively um, identifying drugs dispensed at a 340B safety net providers in our pharmacies. Um, this would have been unduly burdensome, especially during a pandemic. And so our insurance commissioner, we actually filed a complaint, so we were able to use our legislation that we passed in 2021. And our insurance commissioner heard that complaint, came back and actually agreed with us and recommended a decision. And you'll notice in the last part there that since the costs associated with the change would be assessed on 340B entities and not other upon other similar entities, that's the key part of having 340B protections within our legislation, especially on the state level, um, because we are being discriminated against compared to other pharmacies. In this session, we actually do have a freedom of choice is what we're calling it. It's a pharmacy bill that will actually be heard on Tuesday in our Senate Health Committee. It's passed the House. And um, that actually allows for freedom of choice to our patients to decide what pharmacy that they would like to use. So um, an example is last year we had a two-year-old boy that was in our cancer center that was going to have to wait three weeks to get their life-saving meds because they were going through what we call white bagging, <laughs> which is an interesting thing to try to explain, especially to legislators who are wondering why it's called white bagging. But it essentially, um, your PBM or your health plan tells you that it has to come through a certain pharmacy. And so that patient, the two-year-old boy who was waiting for their cancer medication, was going to be waiting three weeks. Our insurance commissioner actually found out, had a complaint filed by the, the parents, which is something we recommended. And the insurance commissioner came out with a special bulletin saying that they were violating our law, which they were. Um, and so that boy got to have their cancer meds that day given in our cancer treatment center. Um, that is what we're talking about when we're looking at this type of legislation. It directly affects our patients' lives. Our providers, they are writing prescriptions for patients that then go into 340B. Um, and those, you know, if, if there's something being um, done on the federal level, what we've seen on discriminatory practices, that can affect our patient care. They may have to switch to a different medication that they might be able to afford because if a 340B is discriminating against it, it's hard to get that coverage. Um, and we have been, um, we've seen a huge attack. I think our 340B has gone down by millions due to multiple attacks on the, on the national level, um, also on the state side. Um, so essentially, the 340B protections go hand in hand um, with PBMs. And next slide. Uh, recommendations. Um, so on a state level, looking at a comprehensive PBM regulatory structure, that's the first thing that we did. Um, we were successful with that and having a strong regulator. So I kept mentioning our insurance commissioner, which was Jim Dodger at the time. Um, he was amazing. He actually didn't get to hand out the um, hearing uh, recommendation. It was actually Alan McVeigh last fall, so he was a little upset on that. <laughs> but, um, but we were able um, to work with him on many things, as well as the 340B discriminatory reimbursement provisions. 
Um, prohibiting modifiers or adjustments, that is key. Um, that is something that we had put in um, in 2019. And we've kind of um, further um, worked on that type of language throughout our legislative roles. Also including broad definitions. So you'll see that our 340B covered entity doesn't just include the hospitals or FQHCs, it also includes our contract pharmacies. So within my own hospital, I actually have a contract pharmacy. So Cavill Huntington Hospital, we partner with Marshall University's pharmacy program, so they own our pharmacy within our outpatient clinic. So that meds to beds program that I was telling you about, that actually goes through Marshall Health's pharmacy. So for us, that's considered a contract pharmacy, but it is under 340B, and so that's something that we use every day, our patients use every day, it's where we have our prescriptions filled. So having any type of discriminatory actions against contract ph pharmacies is key for us as well. Um, including protections for all 340B covered pharmacy types, which I was just explaining, and contract pharmacies, and providing network adequacy provisions. That's what we're doing this session, and that is um, the pharmacy choice and freedom of choice for patients. Um, in West Virginia, we have very limited pharmacies. Um, and so for us, being in our area, you're not gonna come across another hospital pharmacy for at least 30 minutes or an hour, if not more. Um, so for us, contracting with, say, a local pharmacy called Fruth Pharmacy, they are going to be in a county like Lincoln or Wayne or Mingo or Logan, where there might not be another entity. And so having that connection is key for our patients as well. Um, and if PBMs cannot pay a 340B covered entity less than others, um, that is something that we have seen. Um, something that we've even learned more so as of recently is that we are being paid way less than what they normally would pay another pharmacy. Um, and so providing patient choice, that's the key to this legislation. I can't express how much 340B has really helped our patients, our community, um, being able to provide access to care. That is what we are about. Um, and allowing for broad rulemaking, for us it was very different um, as our state is set up differently with legislative rules. Um, but that is key as well. Um, and so um, that's all I have to talk about. Thank you. Thank you. If we could hear from Jeremy Crandall next, please. <clears throat> Madam Chair, is it okay if Greg goes first? Is that all right? Okay, we're gonna, and we're going to be brief. <laughs> Greg. Good morning, and thank you for having me. Oh, thank you. Good morning, and thank you for having me. Um, just a couple of comments to uh, piggyback on what Logan and Abby covered. So uh, certainly we can uh, get more into the details and any questions that you all have about the draft model legislation. But when you review it, I would say that really the most important thing to keep in mind um, that was really behind the intent of it when um, my organization worked uh, collaboratively with NAC on developing it is that it is really there to ensure um, that the 340B financial benefit, the benefit of participating in 340B um, stays with um, the covered entity and that it is not eroded um, by certain PBM practices or policies or that there are not requirements that put in place that would really impede um, the access of the covered entity to being able to use 340B drugs. So they can retain that benefit and do all of the different types of things that Abby and Logan talked about their organizations doing. Um, as uh, Logan said, we now have over a dozen states uh, that have these laws and there are over another dozen states that have introduced um, proposals. So there is a lot of momentum for this issue um, at the state level. Um, when we developed this language, we did not have to um, reinvent the wheel. We were largely able to borrow what we thought were some of the best provisions and practices that we saw um, in different states. So this is really sort of you know growing out of sort of that um, you know, legislative development at the state um, level and I think there, you know, there's a real opportunity here to develop some model legislation that hopefully will allow additional states to adopt these laws, um, bolster the laws of states that already um, have them and you know, ensure greater level of uniformity among those laws. So and I'll turn things over to Jeremy. I really have nothing to add. I think we've covered it all. So just, I would just say thank you to NCOIL for considering this issue. That's it. Thanks, do we have Nick? Thank you, members of the committee. My name's Nick Daugherty. I'm the Director of Policy for Pharma. I'm located uh, in Boston. I cover 
New England region. Just very quickly, um, want to let the committee members know that we did receive a, a copy of the draft legislation. Uh, we're going through it now. We want to make sure we're basically going to do a crosswalk of the draft model and uh, what has happened in other states. And just want to stress uh, a willingness to participate in the conversation um, as the committee members move forward and, and address this issue. Thank you. I just have a quick question, and if any of my colleagues have um, uh, questions, um, this might be for uh, Jeremy or, or anyone. So, um, these federally qualified health centers and, and uh, different locations that actually have opportunity to have this 340B program, you know, we're always talking about access, affordability, access, affordability. And I just want, you know, can you quantify what would happen in some of your health centers if they took these savings away? In New York, they're talking about wanting the savings to go back to the state. Uh, and I know that would be devastating to our uh, health center. So is there any data that you have to quantify what that would look like for your patients or for the healthcare delivery if they clawed back these uh, savings? Yeah, <clears throat> number one, Logan, I'd love for you to weigh in on this, but uh, it really depends on the health center, to be honest. Um, I've heard anywhere from 25 to 50% of, over, of overall operating revenue. Um, would happily get back to you on that. Um, it is just such a moving target and it is information that really just depends on the health center. But I would just point back to Logan's presentation where he walked through all those specific uh, services that an individual health center provides. It really just depends. I mean, I, before I started, I was going back to, there's a health center in West Virginia that has, that has specifically been able to fund a, a community health worker uh, position in the case of another health center, mammography and hepatitis C treatment. So it really just depends on the health center what they do with that savings. Um, but I'd happily give you some specific examples, follow up with the committee with some specific examples from individual states. But Logan, do you want to add anything to that? Madam Chair, I will um, echo a lot of what Jeremy has said. Um, one of the biggest ways is to look at it as the services that will be lost without it. It's hard to quantify that in dollars. But I do know, uh, dollar-wise, that our health center, and I'm sure others, would be in the red if it wasn't for um, our 340B savings. They keep us operating, and they keep um, patients' lives affected for the positive. And if we didn't have the 340B savings, um, we would have to shutter a lot of our clinics. Deborah. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. You mentioned that after the law was passed, uh, that PBMs used a lot of loopholes to get around the law. Can can you address some of those so we know what we're looking at to try to include in the law? What was the biggest way they avoided complying? I, I think the biggest thing we're, we're just getting into in Ohio, there was some language that um, wasn't it was not referring back to the proper language up at the top. So there was a way that they could say that they were paying us equivalent to um, non 340B pharmacies without paying in the structure provided in the law. So it's just making sure that your references match back to the, the proper lines, um, I think is what we, it'll be a simple fix in Ohio, um, what we found, but um, I know in other states they found other things. Um, I don't know the specifics. Um, we'd be happy to get back with you on those. Can I also add on to that? Um, one of the whole, re one of the main reasons that we're sitting here today is that because at this point approximately 15 states have enacted some version of the model before you, we're really learning on a daily and a weekly basis how to continue to update this. And you know, in, in fairness to other uh, interest groups that are interested in this issue. They are also pursuing amendments that we would argue would weaken the legislation as well. But one other item I'll add is it's also really important the role of whether it's the insurance commissioner or what other, what, uh, whatever other regulatory body ultimately enforces it because, Logan, you could probably speak to this, it is sometimes hard for a pharmacy to know whether they're being treated differently than a non-340B pharmacy. And so I would just also emphasize the regulatory piece as well. Um, can you uh, describe the claims identifier process? 
So um, in some of the bills, um, there have been requests to put in claims identifiers, um, and it happened in Ohio after the bill. It's not in the bill. We didn't uh, prevent it. So um, some of the insurers came back and said that you had to identify your claim with a, um, so in the pharmacy we have a thing called the submission clarification code. So we have to put this code in before the claim is processed. There's a big problem with this. When we're in our health center pharmacy, the one I run in my health center, that's not a problem because they're my staff. I can train them to put that in. We can even automate it so it's done automatically. The problem is at our contract pharmacies, they do not know at the point of sale whether a patient is 340B eligible or not. So it's done after the fact. Um, there's, we hire companies that do that. They identify that the, whether a claim is 340B eligible or not. So since the pharmacy staff does not know the eligibility at the time of filling, there's no way for them to enter that claim modifier. So those are really devastating if those get entered. Tom Oliver's in Texas. Um, appreciate y'all being here today. My question is this. So, you know, the 340B program, I think is a great program. And obviously, I'm a huge fan of, of FQHCs and, and what they bring to uh, rural parts of my state and medically underserved communities in my state, some of which are maybe not even rural, uh, just underserved. Uh, but I keep hearing that there are situations where large, you know, either for-profit or not-for-profit healthcare systems acquire uh, rural facilities or indigent clinics and stuff, and now suddenly the whole system's participating in the 340B program. And that's really not what it was designed for, am I right? I mean, is there a way to compartmentalize the savings to make sure that these uh, benefits are staying with the, the folks that, uh, in the facilities that are actually trying to keep the lights on, taking care of vulnerable populations? That's what it's designed for, right? Greg, Greg might be able to talk more to this, but to, in order to qualify to be a 340B entity, you have to meet certain thresholds. So for us, we are a safety net provider. There's only a couple of us in the state of West Virginia. So you have to meet those certain thresholds. You also have to be a nonprofit. So with those thresholds, I think that that speaks to what you're serving. I mean, I, I, I kind of I hear what you're saying, but I kind of disagree. At least where I come from, it seems like the most profitable healthcare systems are all non-for-profit. Um, the, certainly the largest healthcare systems. And my question is just, so when you get to a common tax ID type situation where it's a system, you have wealthy facilities that are making money hand over fist, really benefiting from the same program as a, a small uh, clinic that may be in a medically underserved community, you know, taking care of, of uh, medically, you know, fragile people or uh, those that are underserved or in a rural place. Um, and we're seeing that, and I, I'm wondering to what extent that actually enhances and fuels consolidation within the marketplace where you have these large not-for-profit systems that are just, for whatever reason, going out into the rural communities and acquiring these small rural hospitals uh, that are clearly not making a profit. Thank you for your question, and I'm uh, happy to address it. Um, you know, first off, and I think you were sort of suggesting this, is that only nonprofit or public hospitals can participate in 340B. Um, most categories of hospitals to be in the program, they have to demonstrate that they serve a large volume of low-income patients, Medicaid patients and low-income Medicare. So if a hospital or health system were acquiring a clinic and simply because they were just looking to add more commercial paying patients, ultimately that would probably put their status in the program in jeopardy because you have to be able to demonstrate that. If you're a hospital that doesn't really serve a lot of low-income patients, you're not going to be in the program. You're not going to be able to uh, participate. Um, the other thing that I would add is that, I mean, I think as probably someone who lives in a rural area, I think you're very probably well aware of the trend of a lot of rural hospitals closing. One thing we hear from a lot of our rural hospitals is that 340B makes the difference between them being able to stay open or not. Um, this is a little bit of, of maybe a theory in this moment, but I would say that probably sometimes those rural facilities, those rural hospitals, 
joining a larger system allows that clinic, that facility to actually stay open because they are able to tap into maybe not necessarily great resources, but the greater relative resources of that larger organization. Yeah. I mean, I hear what you're saying, but again, I, I think my point is just that we, we have a program that's designed to help folks that are engaged in, I would say, uh, you know, really humanitarian type healthcare where it's not about the money, it's about helping people find the care that they need. Um, very low margins, difficult to keep the lights on. This is supposed to be a mechanism by which it makes it easier for them to stay in business. And it concerns me when I see, you know, a long list of, uh, pro of participating providers who are some of the, the, the more well-off, well-endowed, wealthier, larger gross revenues annually systems in our country that are all 340B providers. That's not what the program was designed for, right? Well, one thing I would mention is that we've done a lot of research comparing 340B and non-340B hospitals. And one thing I will note is that when you look at their profit margins, you look at large hospitals to large hospitals on down to small hospitals, the profit margins of 340B hospitals are smaller across the board. The other thing too is that they do serve, even though they are less than half of the hospitals in the country, they make up the lion's share of hospitals in terms of the number of Medicaid patients they treat. So I, I think, I, I hear the question you're asking, it's a good one, but I think that the data supports the idea that this program is getting to the proper organizations and, and that it's being used in ways that it was intended. Yeah, I mean, I hear what y'all are saying and I agree with you. We need to make sure that that, that that revenue stays with the facility, that's what it was designed for. But again, I reiterate the fact and to my colleagues as we continue to look at this, we need to be clear about whether facilities that are participating in this program really needed the help to begin with because there are some uh, that are clearly struggling and need it and there are others I think that are like, oh, it's another pot of money so let's see if we can tap into that. Um, and that's what frustrates me. Thank you. Unfortunately, we do need to keep moving on. Um, we had a lengthy discussion last time and it seems like it always prompts uh, more questions. So um, maybe we'll be able to peel a little bit more back at our next meeting. So thank you all very much for coming. If we could have uh, Dr. Uh, Steve Landers come forward, uh, President and CEO from VNA Health Group, we're gonna learn uh, some lessons learned from COVID-19. Good. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the National Council. It's an honor to be here with all of you this morning. Uh, my name is Steve Landers. By background, I'm a family doctor and geriatric medicine physician. And all of my clinical work as a doctor has been primarily doing home visits or house calls for uh, homebound seniors. And that love of home care and elder home care led me uh, to become the, the president and chief executive officer of an organization called Visiting Nurse Association Health Group. We are one of the largest and oldest nonprofit home and community health organizations in the country. We're headquartered in New Jersey and we serve people throughout the state of New Jersey. And we also have programming through the Visiting Nurse Association of Ohio in Northeast Ohio, as well as in Southeast Florida in partnership with Cleveland Clinic Florida. Uh, our teams are incredible people of over three, about 3,000 uh, employees, mostly registered nurses, home health aides, uh, uh, personal care workers, occupational and physical therapists, social workers are out in the community helping people uh, on their days of most need, particularly helping older people, other people that are, are medically fragile. Um, our services also include an array of public health services, outreach uh, to maternal child health outreach, um, programs to prevent HIV AIDS, and the like. Um, this organization uh, makes over one million home visits a year. So our teams are making over a million home visits a year and actually our incredible brave caregivers made over a million home visits in 2020 and early 2021 before there were even vaccines to protect them from the COVID-19 virus. So they were true heroes 
Um, I should note, I, I, I can't not note that one of our uh, past volunteers and advocates and incredibly supportive um, leaders in, in the community for our organization is Commissioner Considine, and I, I bring from our teams an incredible amount of gratitude um, for his uh, volunteerism and community leadership on issues of home and community-based care. Our organization throughout the pandemic was recognized in over 100 publications, including uh, media outlets Good Morning America and CBS's Gail King Show, and I was invited to testify in front of the Senate Special Committee on Aging by Senators Collins and Casey because of the work that our incredible teams have done throughout the pandemic. The things that are brought recognition to our people were one, helping in the immediate crisis where the hospitals were getting overloaded and there was no bed capacity and the emergency rooms were flooded and we quickly set up models to bring people straight home from the emergency room with special supportive care at home, almost like a hospital at home type of concept in order to get people uh, safe care and also uh, decompress the hospitals. Our teams also stepped up to help make sure that seniors who were medically fragile had long-term care at home options as an alternative to nursing facilities. And you know, particularly in my home state of New Jersey, uh, the nursing homes had horrible outbreaks early in the pandemic that led to many deaths. And um, there was a lot of fear and concern. Providing a ho home care option, a safe home care option was critically important. And finally, we received a lot of recognition and, and have done a lot of work of taking vaccines and COVID-19 tests to the hardest to reach populations. Actually, I believe, I don't have a way to fully prove it, but I believe that, that um, I did the first in-home COVID-19 vaccination for a homebound elder who had had a stroke who needed um, access to vaccine. Actually, her daughter is a home health aide and she was gonna get you know, exposed uh, as they spent more time together, hopefully, and having the vaccine was protective for her, but she was homebound, uh, unable to uh, get out of the house. And so we've done hundreds of homebound vaccinations, thousands of vaccinations um, at community sites, motels, uh, boarding homes, homeless shelters, uh, for migrant workers and the, and the like. And so we've tried to get uh, vaccines to the har hardest place. I think I was asked to speak about uh, preparing for the next pandemic, preparing for the next pandemic. And I, I certainly take on this request with a lot of humility. I think any of us that have been in public health or healthcare leadership roles that have gone through the last couple of years, if, if you haven't been humbled and been wrong a few times, uh, then you're probably not looking in the mirror. And so I think that it's, it's, it's critical that I come to you with much humility. Um, I think it's important to think about, hopefully there won't be a, a next pandemic anytime soon, but, um, and we've still got problems with the one we've got, um, that, that we think about it in the context of demographics. Okay, I think that there's a major strategic issue facing our country that as a geriatric medicine doc, I feel obligated uh, to talk about, but I don't believe it's being spoken about enough. We are from 2000 to 2060 in this time period where we're going from having one older person in our country for every five people of working age to having two older people in our country for every five people of working age is doubling. Our, what's called our old age dependency ratio is, is doubling, and that is going to put enormous stress onto our care systems, and also a lot of the people that are aging in our population are our workforce, and I'm gonna to touch on that in a minute. But I don't think I have time for a top 10 list of things to do to prepare for the next pandemic, so I wanna offer you three things that I think came up as critically important, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you them in order of, the, the most important is gonna come last. We'll save the best for last. Uh, the third issue that I want to mention is surveillance. Certainly, infectious disease surveillance is of critical importance, is of national security importance, and uh, we need to continue to think about how do we ramp up our surveillance. But one thing that happened in the home health world that many of you may not be aware of, when the pandemic first arrived in our country in early 2020, it might have actually arrived a little bit earlier, but the, the, that, that being the case, um, and the hospitals are flooding with uh, patients in, in, in my uh, home state of New Jersey. And we had people that needed to come home from the hospital and they needed oxygen, home oxygen concentrators. 
in order to support their respiratory condition, fortunately in most cases temporarily, um, in order to get home. And so um, as a home care provider, we had to find home oxygen concentrators. And shockingly, when we had this kind of surge, there was a shortage. We couldn't find oxygen concentrators. And I actually, I called um, one of my former colleagues. I used to work in Ohio before New Jersey. And uh, it was one of the man largest manufacturers of home oxygen concentrators in the world. And I said, do you guys, we need some oxygen concentrators in New Jersey. Do you have any? Um, we've got a big problem. And he said, Steve, you know, uh, a few months ago, we shipped most of those overseas. So we had something as basic as home oxygen concentrators in our world. There was no tracking, surveying. It was never viewed. It was just a product, not viewed as sort of an indicator of what might be happening from a healthcare standpoint, public health. We had similar issues with things like ventilators, uh, masks, shortages of these things. Um, so I think surveillance is critically important, not just uh, surveillance of uh, organisms and, and also uh, equipment and, and critical pieces to our protection. Um, the second thing I want to point out is that, and, I, and I, I sort of did indirectly in my talk about the recognition that my team had received, is the importance of home and community-based care for an aging nation. Most older people would prefer to be supported in their homes and communities, even though father time seems to always win. Ultimately, even with great medical care, we do run into issues with chronic disease and other conditions of aging. Um, and most of us, if we live long enough, will need some type of help and support, and we much prefer to get that at home. Um, and so we need to focus on strengthening that home and community-based care infrastructure uh, across many aspects, both acute care at home, post-acute and rehabilitative care, long-term care at home, and virtual care at home and telehealth. That's becoming a very prominent way, uh, and, and depending on how uh, our future uh, regulations uh, are, 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 are borne out, uh, particularly at the federal level, I think with Medicare, it will determine how much, how much home care is actually virtualized. But finally, and most importantly, I want to share with you a, um, I think you've seen this news, but I, I want to put a, a unique twist on it, that the workforce, the healthcare workforce, our army of skill and love is depleted. There are shortages across almost every type of healthcare worker in the, in, 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 in the, in the industry. And it has happened because of a whole myriad of reasons uh, related to the pandemic, but also related to our demographics. And so we were walking on a balance beam in many respects before this pandemic as a workforce and all the stressors, economic issues, mitigation policies, uh, stress um, has, have led to even worsening shortages. And I believe in an aging nation, nurses, I'm a physician, I think docs are important. We're not training enough docs, uh, particularly not enough primary care docs, but nurses are the linchpin of a compassionate elder care system. We have to have enough registered nurses because they're not just the direct care providers, they're also the leaders and the team leaders and the um, coaches and the family caregiver supports and the lifelines. We need enough registered nurses. The Bureau of Labor Statistics says that we need about 200,000 new nurses every year over the next decade because of retirements and because of new demands for care because of an aging population. Right now, our nursing schools, our nursing schools are only uh, graduating about 180,000 nurses each year that pass the NCLEX exam, the, the, um, the, the licensure exam. And a, a good chunk of those NCLEX passers don't go on to work as registered nurses. Some, some go into um, graduate programs, become nurse practitioners, which is important, but it depletes the supply of registered nurses. So we have a, we have a 20 to 30,000 a year gap in the number of registered nurses we're training. Now one would ask, and I'm gonna wrap up in one second here, Chair, one would ask, well, how do we encourage more people to go into nursing? Well, it turns out that's not the problem. Every year, our nursing schools are turning away about 80,000 qualified applicants. There are young people, passionate, 
bright, loving young people that want careers in nursing, and it will change their lives and their families' lives if they get this opportunity, and it will also help solve some of the issues we face as an aging population, and they're not being given a chance to go to nursing school. And it has to do with, um, to some degree, the, 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 how rigid um, nursing school uh, expansion can be. It has to do with faculty shortages. Uh, we need to innovate. Um, this should be a period of great innovation and experimentation in nursing education. Most nursing education has been um, bottlenecked because it has to happen in hospitals. Well, I just told you, my team does a million home visits a year that are very rich and interesting for learning, but very little of it involves learning and teaching. We have to figure out how to create more learning opportunities using the breadth of the healthcare industry, not just a few hospitals. So that nursing shortage is critically important. We also have shortages of physicians, primary care physicians, young people in our country that absolutely want to go into these fields, yet our education system is not providing uh, enough, enough slots. So I appreciate the chance to share some thoughts about our pandemic experience and, and I hope I've provided some useful information for your planning. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, just a, a couple points. Actually, that's what I wrote. So let me look. Um, as we're having the conversation relative to, I guess, next steps, and I know uh, your background obviously is uh, uh, with the uh, older population, it, it seems to me, especially as a legislator and, and, and working through this as a legislator for the past couple of years, uh, we hear from the public uh, more than. Uh, I would say most people for everything. If you're talking about unemployment insurance, you know, we were hearing about that. And it, it just seems like after two years, some of the things that I think that really need to be focused on, as I'm sure you're aware, is a universal disaster preparedness plan. And I know you didn't make mention of that, but it seems to me in a state like New York where we were very aggressive and some could say too much and in other states they were doing nothing it makes it very difficult to stop the spread of something if everyone is doing something different so you know we were in boston and the governor talked about having to hijack and he didn't hijack but uh, the plane with the 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 Patriots owner to get PPP, you know, PPE supplies. I mean, so we were not prepared even here to have, you know, masks and you were talking about oxygen. And the other thing is, and we have mentioned this here um, at uh, NCOIL and you mentioned it, they called it the silver tsunami. I think it was one of the plans that, that mentioned that. But I think it's important to note that, you know, as that population ages, you're talking about having a lack of uh, healthcare resources, uh, really, some of the things that were keeping people alive were able to be having them be at home. Uh, that makes it very difficult. And I, I don't think that we're putting enough uh, focus on trying to do that. In New York, we had a huge amount of nursing home deaths uh, that people just could not go back to their homes. They, they weren't prepared to be there. So I don't think uh, there was enough of focus on that. And you, you mentioned demographics, but I would offer that there definitely needs to be more conversation about low income, rural, vulnerable populations, uh, because we saw, especially as far as the spread, lower income uh, populations of, of color, communities of color where folks were not getting vaccinated, were not getting access to care. Uh, we saw in some census tracts where there definitely were more hospitalization and deaths. We definitely need to be making focus on, on that as we're hopefully not having to prepare for one, but it seems like something like this may be inevitable going forward. Uh, Representative Layman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, two, two questions and one kind of piggybacks on the chairs. Uh, on demographics, I'm always, I'm always a little fascinated because Indiana is going down this path of managed care in, in uh, uh, that Medicaid, Medica Medicare space for certain people. But when we talk about the demographics, the rural areas, I, I represent a very rural district, and, and there seems to be a greater desire to go into a community facility uh, because a lot of it is your, your small communities. So from the elderly population, and we have fantastic nursing homes. So when you look, talk about you know the in-home, what people wanting to age in home, is there a, do you have a breakdown kind of in the demographics of, is that run of the gamut gr closer to more uh, urban areas uh, would like to stay in their homes and whereas more rural people might want to go more into the facilities that would, that would be more a sense of community? The, it's, it's a great, great question. And um, 
in terms of the survey data on, on people's preferences, I, I do not know a source that breaks it down related to rurality or, um, or, or in urban areas. I, I think that I, I would like to, in the, in the context, clarify my comment in that it's incredibly important that we have a robust and vibrant system of elder care facilities um, because there will be people both because of preference and because of circumstances that th their quality of life will be, um, it'll be essential that there be wonderful facilities. But um, beyond that, in order to ex expand the, the, the health system, um, we need to support people at home both because of preference and because of need. To give you an idea, in the Medicare system, um, if somebody comes home from a hospital after, let's say, a hip, hip, hip fracture surgery um, and needs support at home, and they come straight home from the hospital, the next 30 days of aftercare cost Medicare about $1,500. If we don't have that home-based infrastructure to provide that service at home, and the primary pathway is to go to facility-based aftercare, that next 30 days of care cost Medicare about $15,000. And so, um, and the outcomes, and, and if the people are appropriately selected, are, are um, equivalent or in some cases better. So it's, a, I think the combi you have, we have a combination of, 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 of providing options for people as well as um, there's an efficiency, a health system efficiency issue as well that we have to address. All right, thank you. And then my second question, separate from that is, you're talking about the nursing shortage. I'm curious moving forward because the biggest reason we saw nurses exit the market in Indiana was because of the vaccine. Uh, we had a lot of nurses who said, look, I, I, you know, I was a frontline caregiver until I was mandated to get the vaccine, and I don't want to get the vaccine, so I'm just going to exit. Uh, I think is some of that, I mean, I, I, mean, I guess you've seen any numbers that would, I, I would just say, knowing from Indiana, I think the majority of nurses who left, left because of the mandate. So how do we move forward? Uh, as you plan for the next pandemic as, as to having nurses who choose not to go that path. Yeah, no doubt. I think that it's the, the shortage has been multifactorial, you know, everything from uh, people uh, being out on quarantine to child care issues related to how the schools had, had, had been managed to um, issues related to uh, mitigation policy, uh, employer vaccine and testing policy. I'll say that we uh, in, in my teams and not see a lot of people that are not in the workforce because of the, the, the vaccine mandate, although um, a lot of people applying for res religious and um, personal medical exemptions, as well as more um, people out of the workforce in the, in the direct care workforce, personal care workers, home health aides, attendants, definitely more of an impact in that group. Um, and, and I think that, again, you've got these multifactorial issues, stresses from the pandemic on top of an already, we already had a nursing shortage before the pandemic. Um, the pipeline just isn't there. If you do, the, it, it, we have a math problem when it comes to nurses. If we look at the output versus the projected needs, it just doesn't match up. And the good news is we've got a lot of young people who are passionate, bright, loving people that want to go into these fields. And if we focus on that educational system, we're going to be able to solve this problem. But in the short run, certainly, all sorts of issues have exacerbated this in various locales and be it vaccination policies and the likewise. But this is a much more complex situation that requires long-term strategic interventions uh, to get it right for the next, hopefully not, but the next pandemic. Representative Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Madam Chair, you and um, Rep. Matt Lehman have um, answered my question, taken the questions and all that good stuff, too. Um, but thank you, Doctor, for being here today. Um, one thing I want to say is on my end in South Carolina, um, in my area, um, Coastal Carolina University, or Georgetown Technical College, uh, we have, from the General Assembly part, we have poured money into those um, colleges that nursing programs would be available. And even with pouring the money in, um, there's still not enough, you know, because uh, the list is long and there's a waiting list. Well, we went out and um, 
one of the colleges from out of state is now um, opening up this month in Myrtle Beach uh, where they will have nursing classes there. So I think all over the world that we need more um, nursing um, colleges and, and, and buildings around and it would help because in our area the numbers are there to attend. We just didn't have the facility and enough teachers to do what is needed. So the nursing program is really uh, much needed uh, and, and I think since the pandemic too, Doc, and I think you can, you can attest to this, that um, the pandemic with many people retirement age and beyond retirement age, they just decided, you know, that now it's time for me to come out. Um, so we do need to work real hard, but I'm saying to those around the table, my colleagues and the legislator, uh, just make sure that your area is pouring money into the universities and technical colleges where um, students could come and get that degree in nursing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, doctor, for your presentation. If we could have Brendan uh, Papard from AHIP come forward, we're going to continue our conversation with the unfunded mandate of COVID-19 testing. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I know we're running low on time, so I will try to go through these quickly. Uh, I was asked to come here to provide an update on the required, the federal requirement that carriers cover over-the-counter COVID tests. Uh, and I am Brendan Papard, Regional Director for AHIP State Government Affairs. From the beginning of this uh, pandemic, health insurers have taken action to cover the costs of uh, tests to diagnose and treat COVID-19, and we do continue to do so. Uh, testing once again became a, an urgent issue with the Omicron surge last fall, and the federal government responded with, a, with this requirement that carriers cover over-the-counter tests. We had already been covering uh, tests that were sent to labs. Uh, health plans worked quickly to implement the guidance in ways that are simple for consumers and uh, we, we've continued to make improvements. In this case, over-the-counter means self-administered and self-read tests. Tests that are sent to a lab for processing are outside of the scope. In order to prevent and detect uh, fraud and waste, fraud, and abuse, uh, plans are allowed to restrict coverage to established retailers who would typically be expected to cover over-the-counter tests. And plans can re also require members to submit reasonable documentation, including proof of the product and the retailer. <clears throat> Within the guidance that the tri-agencies issued, they created a safe harbor. Uh, this is a non-enforcement safe harbor where plans can limit the amount reimbursed for over-the-counter tests for non-network retailers. Plans must provide direct coverage by ensuring adequate access to over-the-counter tests with no upfront costs uh, for out-of-pocket, I'm sorry, no out, no out-of-pocket expenditures. And plans must also make tests available through at least one direct consumer shipping program and one in-person mechanism in order, both of these things, in order to be within the safe harbor. These are some examples on the left side of this slide of uh, how to provide direct coverage. Of course, you can have a pharmacy network. Uh, you can have an alter alternate test distribution site, uh, non-pharmacy retailer, and then, of course, the direct-to-consumer shipping program, which is also required. There was some additional guidance. Uh, Plans may be able to limit direct coverage, uh, limit the direct coverage program to tests from a limited number of manufacturers, and the federal government indicated that they would not take enforcement action if a plan is temporarily unable to provide adequate access through the direct coverage program due to a supply shortage. And people may remember that uh, back in January we did, in fact, have at least in certain areas of the country uh, getting uh, access to tests. 
So one other note, uh, at the, uh, the, the, on February 3rd, CMS announced that starting in the early spring, it will begin covering uh, over-the-counter tests for Medicare beneficiaries. Medicare had not been able to cover these tests when the original announcement was made, uh, and uh, so they've, they've now indicated they will be. <clears throat> I just want to touch on this. I think it's very important, uh, the issue of price gouging, um, because we have seen it, and there is a concern about the cost of tests. So in 2021, AHIP conducted a survey of health insurance providers in the commercial market to gather information on prices charged by out-of-network providers for COVID-19 tests. Now, again, these are the lab tests, not the, uh, the self-read tests. The results found that out-of-network providers charge significantly higher prices, more than $185 when the average is, a wonder, uh, when the average is $130 for more than half of the tests. So, and then this, this is just a graphic of, of kind of what we've been seeing. Uh, this is an extraordinary time, and plans have been pleased to be able to step up and help wherever we can. This requirement, however, is a deviation from the traditional role of insurance, which is to improve health, which is to improve individual health and not monitor public or workplace health. We feel strongly that, while again, we've been happy to to step up and provide this coverage for over-the-counter tests, we believe this should sunset with the conclusion of the public health emergency. And I will halt there and answer any questions. Thanks. I wanted to know, with the over-the-counter tests, I know in New York that there's the honor system uh, where people are supposed to, whether they got the free test kits in the mail that the president had mentioned or uh, they can go to a pharmacy and, and pay. Um, and the honor system is if you, you know, happen to test positive for COVID, you're supposed to call the Department of Health. Well, I like to think that, you know, my, my neighbors are good citizens and they would do that, but I have to imagine that the response rate is probably not high. Is there any um, information you have relative to the correlation of home test kits and actual um, forwarding that to the positivity number rate? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. And uh, the problem is there's no mechanism to require people. As, as I said, these are, you take the test at home, you read it at home. We, we did this, my son wound up with COVID back in January. He didn't like it very much when we did the test, but you know, it came up positive. We reported it to the school. There's no requirement to do that, um, and there's no mechanism to make it happen. We do not have any data on it, but it may be that the rate is quite low. Oh, and can you give us an overall number? How much do the tests cost overall? How much we spent? So within the safe harbor, plans are able to, and I, I ran through that slide pretty quickly, but um, able to limit it to $12 per test. I'm just saying overall, with the health plans, accumulative, how much? Of how much are we spending on it? I don't have that information okay. at this time. Okay, it, it's still a relatively new item. Okay. Tom? Brennan, thank you for bringing this up. And, and we've certainly seen this in Texas, with, especially because, as, as you well know, we've talked about this before. We have a certain freestanding ER problem as well. Um, and I'm, I didn't hear you mention this, but I was wondering if you could talk briefly about it. It's not just the cost of the test, but one, one of the things that we're seeing, at least in our state, is that for a drive-through testing location adjacent to a, a freestanding emergency room, there may be a facility fee charge being charged that may be in excess. In some cases, we had some charges in excess of five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 out of network, of course, and then the insurance company is left with this difficult decision of, this person needs a COVID test, should we just not cover it? And then who's the bad guy now? So can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so again, uh, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not sure that the survey, we had the information I provided on the survey included the facility fees. I think that was just the tests. Uh, that has been a problem. Uh, it's my understanding that the tests are being covered. We're required to cover the tests. Uh, the issue is how much are we paying out uh, as a result of that, and that's it's been a serious concern. Um, I, I, we had the discussion about uh, the surprise billing from uh, a couple of days ago. Obviously, some of the 
dispute resolution pieces are now up in the air, but um, I, I don't know that I, I have, inf again, I don't have information about how much we've seen of this. We, I, certainly those fees how, and some fairly outrageous fees have occurred. Uh, I, don't, I don't believe it's widespread, but it, it has happened. I mean, the, the issue that I, I rant was informed about was that, you know, it was one of these difficult decisions of it's an out-of-network charge. It's obviously unreasonable. But then the question is, from the insurer's standpoint, in the middle of a pandemic, do you just deny the claim? And then, of course, it's, it's like, oh, we see how you are. You, now you're denying people access to, to <clears throat> getting, you know, coverage for this uh, testing in the middle of a pandemic. So, so it's sort of like a catch-22. I was just wondering if you'd heard that at the national level or if that was just a local thing. My, yeah, I have not heard that carriers were widely denying well they coverage. weren't that's my point they're paying yeah. the claims so yeah. it's not really yeah. a yeah. surprise medical billing or balance right. billing issue because right. they're paying the claims because they're sort right. of afraid not to pay the claims and and within the context of the pandemic it was important that people get access and not have to worry about should i go get the test or not so again it, it was a problem but it wasn't one that was insurance saying we're not going to cover it because we were required to and we thought it was the right thing to do Thank you. Thank you so much, Brendan. Um, let us have Miranda Mater, please, from AHEP and JP Weiske uh, come forward. We're going to have a, a brief presentation on value best care. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the opportunity to spend some time with you uh, this morning. Um, my name is Miranda Motter. Uh, as the uh, Madam Chair indicated, I am the Senior Vice President uh, for State Affairs and uh, Policy for AHIP. AHIP is the National Trade Association uh, that provides uh, health insurance coverage to millions of Americans through employers, through um, uh, public and private partnerships looking at uh, market-based solutions, um, providing coverage to many individuals in your states. Um, so as I said, I appreciate the opportunity to come and spend a couple minutes talking about value-based care. This is really uh, an opportunity and a follow-up, I think, to some of the conversations that we had in November um, about uh, health care cost and about utilization management. And so I just wanted to uh, spend a couple minutes talking about what is value-based care. Um, looking at the traditional sort of predominant historical fee-for-service system, and some of those challenges and how value-based care actually provides solutions to that in a very um, overview way, just provide a brief description of some of the models and those payment structures because um, they are very unique. They um, are very layered and complicated depending upon uh, what model and what population um, states, employers are focused on. Um, and then certainly it's always important to measure progress in terms of um, how many dollars are actually going into value-based care and how does that look? So I'll just spend a couple minutes talking about that. Um, a couple minutes talking about COVID. COVID really provided, I think, some good lessons to learn specific to where we're at in value-based care and the importance of accelerating that work. And then just quickly, lastly, just talking about what's next uh, from a payer's perspective in terms of the future of uh, value-based care. So, um, is, as many of you know, now more than ever, uh, employers, uh, public payers, so whether it's Medicare or Medicaid, uh, recognize the um, important need, the critical need to move away from the traditional fee-for-service uh, system or models of payment uh, to a value-based care um, payment program or um, model, really to help deliver better coordinated care for patients uh, while at the same time either controlling or at least levelizing um, the, the high cost of care. So before I go into some more details, um, I just wanted to spend a quick moment sort of go running through some key terms because I, you know, I think sometimes as we talk about this issue, some of these terms are used interchangeably. Some of them are used depending upon if we're talking about a federal program versus a state program. And so when we talk about value-based care, we're really looking at the idea of improving quality and outcomes for patients. 
Uh, when we talk about value-based payment, so some of you may know that these are used, these terms are used in interchangeably. So value-based um, payment, value-based care, um, and this is simply refers to um, you know, value-based care that involves a payment model. Alternative payment model, or APM, I know that um, many of you in your states, quite frankly, are either looking at APMs or talking about APMs. This is really a term of art that Medicare uses for um, you know, a value-based payment model. So again, sometimes those terms are used interchangeably. Accountable um, care organization, again, is another sort of popular APM model or value-based care model. Uh, fee-for-service, as I said, is the predominant historical payment system that the United States has used um, and how they pay providers uh, for each and every service that is rendered. Um, and then lastly, quality measure. Certainly this is the sort of foundation of value-based care. So this really means, you know, a predefined uh, set of agreed to quality measures in terms of definitions and what they are um, that look at safety, outcomes, patient satisfaction, uh, that those payments may be benchmarked up against. Um, so again, as we think about what a value-based care model is, I think it's really important to understand and remember that there is no one-size-fits-all. Um, you know, there is no single approach to an APM or a value-based model that will work for each and every provider or practice or specialty. Um, value-based models are outcome-based. They're outcome-driven. So, in a, you know, as we think about the traditional fee-for-service model, which, again, the, the predominant model, the historical model that the, United, that the U.S. Uh, healthcare delivery system was built on, that pays providers, again, for each and every service that is rendered. And as you can see, it incentivizes um, um, volume um, in care because it, because it pays for each service. In contrast to that, um, paying for value, um, so, you know, basically ties those reimbursements, again, to an agreed upon objective, to agreed upon quality benchmarks, to make sure that the that the services are providing, the care that is being provided is actually improving uh, outcomes, improving the quality of care that that patient may be re uh, receiving. The other important thing to remember about value-based care, value-based models, is that there is a level of financial risk um, as part or embedded in those models. So value-based payment models entail some sort of degree where the provider actually agrees to take on some level of responsibility um, and in the responsibility in ways where they actually have control um, and some flexibility in how they provide the care to those patients. That financial risk looks different um, in terms of it may be, um, you may hear one-sided risk versus two-sided risk. So there's certainly lots of variation. And ultimately the goal is that the model gives um, physicians and providers flexibility in how they provide the care to their patients. Um, real quick, I just wanted to, you know, provide this sort of chart, again, as you think about the traditional fee-for-service system and what it stands for, what it does, the challenges that it poses, and really how value-based care can um, provide a solution to that. So, again, fee-for-service pays only for a defined set of services. What is the challenge? The challenge is, is that, the, you know, multiple times, lots of times, that does not reimburse for things like, um, you know, phone calls, emails. Um, care management, nurse visits, use of technology. So a lot of those, you know, things that we think about either as social determinants of health, um, things that we found were incredibly important, uh, obviously, as we just came, um, are, came out of COVID and as we're still in COVID. Um, the value-based um, system um, allows, again, provider flexibility to change um, the number and the types of services because it really looks at the patient specifically and looking at what is the patient need. Fee-for-service rewards, again, volume of services. Um, this can encourage um, utilization. It can uh, discourage cost-efficient uh, care. Uh, and the other important thing, and this, again, is, um, um, you know, dovetailing the conversation that we had back in November, um, lots of times the fee-for-service system, you know, it, the, the payer's utilization management tools, whether it's prior authorization or other strategies, um, really frustrate uh, providers and patients. And so when you look at a value-based care model, those that include this financial risk, financial accountability by, adjustment, by adjusting payment up or downward 
really gives the providers that flexibility and allows them, depending upon where they're at in that model, to um, utilize their own um, utilization management internally as opposed to that payer requirement. Um, fee-for-service does not consider quality of care. It does not measure. So, you know, from an employer perspective, they have no idea what they're paying for. Um, in, and, and again, on the value-based system side, um, the quality metric Directs are defined, and so that really is a solution to understanding what you're paying for. Lastly, and I, and I do think this is really important, fee-for-service does not consider patient acuity. So lots of times when you may have a patient that is sicker, that may need more care, um, it may actually contribute to inequities. It may discourage a provider from wanting to care for that patient. But when you look at value-based, um, there is risk adjustment built into that, and those things are built into the payment structure. I am not going to go into details on this, though. The reason um, for the visual of this is really to understand the, the payments actually sit on top with the model sitting on the bottom. And as you move from left to right, we're talking about um, providers taking on more risk. So on the very left-hand side of that, you know, a provider may just be taking on upside risk. And what that means is if, if the quality and outcomes have improved, they may take on the savings from that, but as you move further to the right, that provider may be taking on up and downside risks. So for example, if they don't meet those outcome benchmarks, they actually assume the financial risk um, for that. Um, the other thing is you move from left to right, the things like I talked about, utilization management tools, so you know, prior authorization, maybe step therapy, those sorts of things, the provider in the, has more control over those. Um, those are things that, you know, the health plan may not assume because that provider takes on the financial risk for that. Um, quick example um, is you, if you remember the prior slide with some of the types of uh, payment models, I just wanted to run through an example here. So is, you know, one of the examples is an episode of care. So if we look at an episode of care, um, and those are normally paid, what you may hear as a bundled payment. And again, I know that many of your states, whether it's through the Medicaid program or your employer community, are actually doing a lot of this work. Um, so what it basically does, and you can see that, there is a defined service, you'll have a defined set of providers, and a defined budget over a period of time. And so it really creates this incentive to hit outcome goals, to hit um, spending goals, and then where those goals are met, there can be some shared savings back with those providers. Uh, another example, as you move further across that uh, continuum that we saw, if you talk about population-based care, these are really models that look at a certain patient population and say, all right, we want to improve diabetes management within this, this certain patient group. And so as a result, this is really a much more risk um, model where the provider is taking, you know, probably up and downside risk and they're actually getting paid a prospective payment to care for that patient. And so they have a lot of, you know, choice in terms of how they provide those services. Um, you know, as I said, measuring uh, progress is very, very important. The Healthcare Payment Learning and Action Network, this is actually a live link, and I would encourage you, if you have an interest in this, to go to this website. There are a lot of resources, but um, LAN, as you may hear it described, is a public-private partnership. AHIP is a member. There are many health plans. There are many providers. There are many employers uh, and policymakers that are part of this group, and their goal is really to accelerate value-based care in the U.S. healthcare system, and not only accelerate that care, but actually measure how it's going. So recently, um, this, the data um, shows that the adoption of these two-sided risk models that I talked about has increased steadily. So what I did is I wanted to make sure I showed you both in terms of payments, so healthcare spend, and actually in terms of covered lives that we've actually seen over the past few years, that the dollars that are actually going into value-based care models are increasing. And likewise, the number of lives that are impacted um, and, and are in value-based care, meaning that there is accountability for outcome and quality is increasing. You'll also see there at the bottom that it's also increasing across markets. So this is happening again in the commercial market. This is happening in the um, Medicare original market and the Medica Medicare Advantage market, and it's also happening in Medicaid. Again, I know many of your states, particularly in the Medicaid market, are really driving to value-based care. 
Um, this, again, is just a graphic uh, that identifies the most recent measurement that was done in 2020. Uh, you know, 40% of U.S. healthcare payments that would represented approximately 238 million Americans, so that's about 80% of the covered uh, population, flows through, and you'll see here it references categories three and four. Um, this next slide actually shows you, and I apologize for how small it is, but it really shows you, um, you know, categories three is, um, you know, value-based that may be sitting on top of a fee-for-service system, and then those population um, based uh, model. So again, to the extent that you've got interest, I'd encourage you to, to look further at some of this. Real quick, as I said, COVID really taught us some really good lessons about value-based care. Um, and what we found was that those providers that were part of value-based care um, um, programs, they really fared a lot better than those providers that were relying upon fee-for-service. So as we saw, you know, COVID required specific care, whether it was testing, uh, vaccines, treatments, um, there was a, a very big concern about continuity of care for patients. In many states across the country at one point or a time, not, um, elective services were delayed. And so those systems that relied upon elective care services from a financial perspective and were in a fee-for-service model really struggled. Telehealth, we spent a lot of time talking about how providers had to build those systems. And what we found is that providers that were in a value-based model had the resources and flexibility to be able to uh, build those platforms that were needed. Um, lastly, what do we think is next? Um, you'll see here just some percentages and uh, some data around, you know, 87% of payers really believe that um, value-based adoption will continue to increase. Um, and, you know, the other thing I would say is that there is really a lot of innovation in this space and it really allows you to do things like, you know, build health equity issues, build social determinants of health in these kinds of models. And that's really um, the direction and, and a lot of the focus um, and innovation that's happening right now. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Miranda. Uh, we do have an unscheduled speaker, and JP, if you could just give us your 90 second, I apologize. Yeah, no worries. Elevator um, presentation on this, and we look forward to having you come back and give us more information in July. And everyone has their hand out. You bet. Uh, this is J I'm JP Weiske. I'm with the Campaign for Transformative Therapies. Uh, it is a Big Ten organization that includes insurers, patient groups, and drug manufacturers. We're focused on outcomes-based arrangements. The QR code at the front of this, you will be able to download our uh, fresh, hot off the presses paper. What we found when we started interviewing Medicaid uh, agencies is that there is no policy developed on this. So we decided to set out and put together a policy document around outcome-based arrangements for gene therapies that are likely, that are in the pipeline, which will cost potentially millions of dollars uh, per treatment and to try to figure out a way to structurally uh, pay for those treatments through Medicaid and other, other services. So thank you. Looking forward to more discussion later. Thanks. Thank you so very much. Thank both of you for coming today. Um, okay, colleagues, we have five. Uh, Madam Chairwoman. Yes. I want to thank you, and uh, I want to help you to stay on schedule as we do have one more meeting to wrap up. So uh, with consideration of number six, um, I would like to move that we adopt A through E all at one time, and I would like to make a motion for that adoption. There's a motion on the table to consider for readoption all five models uh, that have been uh, introduced today. Is there a second? All in favor? Aye. Abstentions? Okay, the ayes have it. Thank you, Representative. Any no's? No. Okay. So we're going to move on to any other business. I just want to quickly make mention that uh, at our next meeting um, that we're going to be having a conversation about biomarker testing and that falls right in line, uh, I guess, sort of relative to what JP was just mentioning. It's an uh, innovative and targeted way to look for gene proteins and other substances that can provide information about cancer. I've introduced a bill on this in my home state of New York, and a copy of that bill appears in your binders on page 282. Uh, I'd like to start that process of developing the bill into an NQL model. We will discuss this further in July, but I'm happy to hold any conversations uh, about this bill before we get uh, to New Jersey in July. If there are any questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, can I have a motion to adjourn? Second. All in favor? 
adjourn. Thank you.